Good morning. You're listening to WXOX 97.1 FM in Louisville, Kentucky, or perhaps you're streaming on artxfm.com. This is LVA's Art of on the radio, the show produced by Louisville Visual Art. My name is Keith Waits. I'm your host. I'm here today to talk with an artist named Susie Harrison. Uh, she is a uh, textile artist who is also a teacher. She teaches at Western Warriors Early College. She teaches at the Governor's School for the Arts, uh, which uh, I think the Kentucky Governor's School for the Arts. Is, yes, yes. This summer, right. yes. And, uh, and she's also a, a member of the Jefferson Public Art Commission. And uh, she also uh, is the resident artist and educator at Brick Street Studios. So she has many identities, which is very common, of course, in the world of arts. But uh, the, 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 the reason, the event that brought us together to talk today is uh, her exhibit at Pyro Gallery, which is opening September 3rd, uh, Staying Cozy During COVID, Comfort Designs by Susie Harrison. And uh, she's gonna talk about that exhibit right now. Susie, welcome. Oh, well, thank you so much, Keith, for having me on uh, your show. Um, I'm pleased to be here and to be able to talk a little bit about um, my upcoming show and sort of uh, the creative process that led to it. Um, uh, well, as the title said, um, my show sort of addresses um, um, how we're all kind of coping uh, during the pandemic and sort of uh, what are some of the strategies um, people are dealing, uh, use to sort of deal with the isolation um, that they may be experiencing or experience at, at the height of the sort of um, quarantining back in, I guess, March, uh, March 2020 onward. Um, and then uh, kind of how I um, sort of how I personally sort of manage the time. Um, I'm a teacher and um, back in, I guess, uh, end of March 2020, uh, we moved into um, NTI where we were uh, working at home, uh, teaching on our computers. And um, so I was basically at home with my four animals, uh, working, uh, teaching, trying to like come up with art projects that could be done with me, like giving demonstrations through the computer. <laughs> And um, I also was, uh, ended up doing a lot of uh, sketchbook work. Um, and I found that uh, working with color and indie ink markers um, in my sketchbook uh, really, uh, really is kind of very meditative and therapeutic. And I think so, like so many other people, I mean, I think there's all sorts of testimonials on the internet as to people getting in touch with like crafting and um, art making and and cooking and and things that they can do at home. Um, so at yeah, uh, my show starts in this place of me kind of um, tunneling in to my sketchbooks uh, with color and markers um, to try to probably um, you know just kind of cope with all that was going on. So, so did that, did the work that you created during that period of time, is it different? Like what, what changed for you or were you just able to maybe, were you able to do more? Yeah, it's really different. It's not something I've really ever done before. Um, it, I think, you know, I was very, very privileged um, because I got to stay home. I mean, my, my husband who worked, worked was was working at Home Depot had to mask up and go into work every day. He's I guess like along with all the other essential workers. Mm -hmm. I got to stay home in the safety of my house um, for a year and a half before uh, JCPS went back to school in March uh, 2021. Right. So you know for a year. Um, I it was in this really solitary space at home um, teaching, but you know you're not on eight hours a day. You're doing a lot of paperwork, but so I think it um, really became a very reflective time. And so much like other people who've said, you know, they had time to think, 
I mean, there are all these uh, stories now about people quitting their jobs because they had the time to think about what they really wanted to do with their lives. So they're now like resigning from jobs to go off and do other things. Um, what happened to me is I, I, so anyway, I was privileged enough to have that time to reflect and uh, really think about some of the things I've always wanted to do. And before I became a teacher at JCPS, I had won, uh and I had left my job at Collegiate, I really have always wanted to design wallpaper and design, um, you know, and my friend said, oh, you, you, your stuff makes great wrapping paper. And so there was a side of me, even though I've normally done sculpture and installation work, um, I just, I really wanted to have this moment when I kind of did something like a designer. And so, um, I actually have taken my sketchbook drawings that are very improvisational. They're kind of automatic drawings, very much like the surrealist. You just start and you see what happens. And uh, there is no such thing as a mistake. Uh, the good, bad, and the ugly are all on the page because it's a little bit more an articulation of how you're feeling and what sort of the detritus of your life. It's not really it's not really about beauty. It's not really about making art as so, as so much as just sort of an expression of your interior landscape at the time. So like so, a confessional? Yeah, it's more, and, and the color is more like, it's sort of an emotional expression. So I took those, I photographed them and digitized them and then turned them into patterns and then um, I'm not really a textile artist, uh, although I've worked with a lot of different materials and I've worked with fibers before. Um, anyway, so I had them output uh, by a, you know, a commercial textile mill. And they, they basically, um, it's really amazing. They have the technology to literally like set up you know the loom with the warp and the weft so it's they're not printing the image on the blanket but it's in like it is of the blanket it's you know they've registered and you know uh organized the warps and the weft so that your image is completely like um threaded and woven into the blanket and um so it was just this really cool thing for me because I've always done personal flotation devices for years. I've, you know, made things that look like life preservers and I've asked people what keeps them afloat and I've gone to public spaces and had people wear my personal flotation devices and tell me what keeps them afloat. And I've made big posters of people's words and, and like, you know, what keeps them afloat with them wearing my, personal flotation devices. So it was kind of strange people wrapping themselves in my blankets, kind of in a weird sort of way is an extension of that, but I didn't, I, I didn't necessarily, you know, intentionally make that connection. It's just coming from this place of need and comfort and, and needing to feel secure mm -hmm. and, uh, it was very, I don't know if you see my card, I wish I could like flash it up here, but um, the, the two people who are featured on my card, one of them had an aneurysm and is lucky to be alive. And um, she's really um, gone through a lot of therapy to get back, but to have her like feeling comforted by having my blanket on her uh, feels it, it's really an interesting, if this feels good. And mm -hmm. um, a core part of my show is actually the website of what, who's launched a site, uh, who we lost Kentucky, um, dot org. And you might have heard of it already. Right. The, governor's, the governor's tweeted it out. And so um, in my show, beyond the blankets that I've designed is an installation of uh, my living room, basically. I'm 
transplanting all the furniture. I don't want to give it all away, but um, no. it's good. It's going to be an installation, and her um, her website is sort of there's going to be a portal uh, to the website um, so that people, if they want to, uh, can it could, can go in and 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 interact. It's an interactive element in the installation. They can go in and uh, read the stories. The, that people have posted about their loved ones who've been lost to COVID. Um, but, it, and they can also uh, write, they can, if, they, if they've experienced loss themselves, they can uh, write uh, and, and participate in the website and they can sit on my couch and, and do that. Um, my sketchbooks will be around and Andy Brashear, uh, will be on a loop with his daily updates because he's so much a part of that feeling of security I experienced. Um, well, he is, I agree. It, it's, it's interesting all the things you're saying about, um, you know, I never thought about it, but when you think about the, the life vest, uh, it, it's a flotation device. I think about it in a very functional way, but it also is enclosed. It's like Pillow, yeah, it's it's uh and and so of course and we all we all have our favorite blankets, comforters, quilts, whatever. Yes, yes, and I don't think that ever goes away. And um, no, I uh, our, my the the website is not just for people who died of COVID. It's also for uh people who've been lost during COVID mm -hmm. because the thing that strikes. Are we okay for time? Sure. Oh, we're okay. fine. Um, the thing that I think the bigger issue about COVID, which we haven't fully addressed as a society, is that uh, there's been a huge spike in overdoses, in suicides, um, in people experiencing homelessness, um, and also gun violence around the country. And mm -hmm. Uh, my school, there, we've lost four students this year in 2021 uh, to gun violence. And so um, for me, uh, her website uh, is, is serving all the people who lost someone who died from COVID like directly, like they got COVID, but it's also for all the people who lost someone uh, during COVID, because the the stressors um, that COVID created, both uh, you know financially, economically, environmental, you know all those stressors actually um, you know triggered their death or triggered a behavior that led to their death. And so um, you know you can you can come in and just see my kind of doodly blanket designs but that's that's not I there's a um I there's a whole lot more there at least for me about um you know just how what people are experiencing the, during this time and again I I'm privileged I got to stay home a lot um I have a house I'm not experiencing um being you know thrown out on the street or you know, homelessness, but um, I think so many people have really, really been impacted. Oh. Well, from the very beginning of the pandemic, I've been curious because I, I you know, you, you, maybe this was just me immediately looking for the silver linings, but thinking that for visual artists, they can still function very effectively because m most visual artists are working in an isolated way. You're working alone in your studio, you may collaborate and stuff like that, but basically, to go into a room alone without anybody else around and make art is is what is what people who are visual artists do. But at the same time, you know, what what does the pandemic push them or motivate them to do? And were there some visual artists that really didn't feel like making art? But I but I feel like it, it is the nature of artists of all stripes that they will take this experience and translate it into something. And right. But, and, and there's been some more immediate response to things, but it's, you strike me as the first thing so far where I feel like I'm seeing um, somebody who didn't, who just didn't make the work during the pandemic, but for whom this work would only exist because 
perhaps of the pandemic. Yes, that is true because I really, um, very honestly, my job is so intense mm -hmm. that uh, my daily practice suffers. So to have been drawing every day for a number of hours, just daily for a year was just such a powerful experience for me. And it was like, and I'm not, I mean, I mean, I'm color, color is like, was so like, um, right. So important. I mean, I ran out. I mean, <laughs> they're expensive. Those Indian. The India inks. The yeah, ink markers, cause they're non-toxic, but I like, go through them. But, um, I looked, I suddenly dawned on me. I was like, why haven't I been using color my whole life? Like I, I look back at some of my sketchbooks from before and I'm going, why i i don't even know why i didn't feel like i had you know was given permission to use color because color really um really is very therapeutic i think working with color and um i did want to i did want to joke with you that you know for the introverts and because i joke about this with most of my friends who are introverts this wasn't the pandemics in some ways wasn't very different <laughs> Right. I'm kind of used to going home and spending a lot of time by ourselves anyway. So like, um, you know, in some ways it wasn't a hardship for the introverts. And um, I think so in some ways the introverts were leaders. And I also think sometimes the quiet people were leaders. I mean, I had students who normally are drowned out in the noise of a school building who were totally participating totally logging in um and we're leaders of discussions uh during nti who you normally wouldn't hear from during the school year and um you know and i think uh, artists and people who are introverts who were coping during all this isolation and shutting down and locking down uh probably could teach you know probably were uh, helping maybe the extroverts like figure out what to do with themselves. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, extroverts had to find a way to, you know, I, I imagine extroverts sitting in the house going like, I want to go out, I want to go out, I want to go out, I want to go out. And, and, you know, they had to find a way to. Um, I mean, had their Zoom parties or something. You know, yeah, some or something time. to get involved in. That's an interesting observation though, you know, because I, uh, when, when the, when the pandemic started and we had to, we vacated the WXOX studio and I started doing these interviews uh, this way, recording them through Zoom. I did, I, it did allow me to talk to some teachers. And, uh, you know, th that's an interesting observation. A lot of people talked about maybe losing touch with some kids who didn't have the technology to, to engage fully. Um, they talked about that there were certain kinds of opportunities, like particularly like performing arts uh, teachers, you know, in theater arts, that a lot of a lot of great performers were not doing anything, so they were very available for like online master classes and things. But that's interesting to think that the introverts actually flourished during this time. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, when uh, GSA Governor's School for the Arts was mm -hmm. virtual in 2020, there were some actually some really interesting. Um, aspects to it that were never part of um, the in-person program. So right. for instance, when we met, people were working in their houses, often in their, their rooms, their personal rooms. And so there was an intimacy. We were, all had our screens on. We're all like working at tables, but we're in our own environments. We're in our houses. So we're, we're sharing our, you know, bedrooms, uh, sitting rooms, whatever, you know, kitchen, wherever we're sitting with the, pe with the other people. And so there was um, sort of a level of intimacy from kind of, you know, being able to see into where people live that is not typically part of GSA. Typically we've pulled them out of their home environments and they're all in dorms in a strange place. So right. for them to be making art while their family lives are still going on, I mean, they weren't in a bubble. They weren't all together, isolated from their friends and family at home, like not distracted, not having to deal with family, you know, dynamics. They were all having to 
deal with their dyna family dynamics and try to make all this art. And the same thing with the uh, students during the school year, they're, you know, they're logging in and, um, you know, they might have a little brother and they might be helping sibling at the same time. I mean, there's a lot, a lot going on at the same time. It was really interesting though, this year, I've only been back two weeks, but the level of um, connection I had with the students who did NTI and did log in is so strong. Like my level of rapport has probably the best it's ever been because I had those moments with just, you know, smaller groups of people online with me discussing something where there wasn't any disruption, there wasn't a kid yelling or, you know, interrupting. It was just, you know, very um, small groups of people interacting. So it's, 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 there are some pluses. I mean, mostly mine is just like in terms of missing kids and losing kids and, you know, not, but, um, there, in terms of rapport, the kids who got online and were participating really, um, I think they got something from it. And I definitely, I definitely learned a lot. I definitely feel like I know how to relate to them better having had that chance. Well, the silver lining is important as we were chatting before and I've had that we started to record and I've had these conversations with many, many people in, in all kinds of arts disciplines that these, these technologies are tools that we can now take forward. I imagine, for example, a kid that gets very sick and has to miss a lot of school, but could perhaps just simply, you know, all, all it takes is a, a, a camera or a laptop or a tablet or something, and you can bring that kids. They don't right. have to really cut off anymore. Right, and, and you see those robots with the with the screen and moving around as if they're <laughs> they're you know the kids in the room. But we don't even need that. Just like you said, just a simple laptop can do it, and um, and that's great. And and so. Yeah, so in my installation, my lap, my laptop is there, um, and uh, Andy's on the screen. <laughs> Andy's on at four. Um, another mean? thing that gives me comfort is my mother saying was English, and so I grew up with tea time. So you know, <laughs> the tea cozy, the tea cup, that's all part of it. So you mentioned it's your laptop and you talked about your, your, your sofa. So are these things going, are they, are you going to be without your sofa and without your laptop during the run of this uh, installation? Well, at least without one of them. <laughs> it's a great yeah. sacrifice you're making in order to bring, uh, to bring this. No, I think I'm going to, when I install it, I'm going to be sitting there having to like clean it with wool light. Cause I have so many animals. Like, so I don't want to bring the animal. <laughs> odors into the gal. We'll just put a sign on the door saying if you're allergic to cats and dogs. <laughs> Take your antihistamine. <laughs> Maybe this is, of course, if everybody's wearing their face covering. That's they true. Well, they'll be okay. They'll, they'll have protection. <laughs> Again, the silver lining of the face mask. Um, uh, I want to I want to ask you about uh, Brook Street Studios. Uh, this is uh, because this is so this has been since 2014. What is Brook Street Studios? You are resident artist there and educator. So, and, and you're, but you're not the only artist there. So what's no, going on? Yeah, there's a, I have a young, uh, I, I have two artists in there right now. Uh, Catherine McCadden, who graduated from Indiana University a few years ago. And um, uh, Shamia Gaither, who's a graduate of um, the, the uh, Kentucky, uh, what's the College of Art and Design? KCAT, oh, it's a KCAT. College of Art and Design. Yeah, yeah. Um, and now she's I, she's actually in a graduate program at Rutgers, um, but cool. she's here right now. And and um, so they're 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 they have studio space there. Um, in the past, I actually had a kind of a creative um, expression therapist. It's kind of like an art therapist, but it's a little more, mm -hmm. I guess, broad. But um, so I've had different people. Um, working out of the space, but um, it took a number of years to renovate it. And because I'm so busy, it's been hard to actually kind of maintain regular um, hours, but um, I really make it a concerted effort this year to have regular programming. And so um, six, six young artists are um, 
six women artists are having a show called Transitions. Mm -hmm. uh, and it opens Friday, August. August 27th. 27th from like yeah. six to nine. So we're installing this weekend. And um, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a fun theme because they're all in kind of different places, but they're all going through transitions. So our youngest has transitioned from high school to the School of the Art Institute, is busy on that, uh, her undergraduate degree. Um, a few others graduated from undergrad a few years ago and are kind of transitioning into work life and trying to figure out how to make art and also do their 40 hour a week job. Um, I have another who was my student teacher at Western and she's now a full-time teacher in JCPS, but she transitioned from being student teacher and a graduate student to being a full-time public school teacher. Um, and then I have a, another student who, uh, three of them actually are alum of uh, the Governor's School for the Arts. So wow. it's really fun that I had them, like, you know, uh, and one of them's a, uh, one of them's a graduate from uh, collegiate. So I was her art teacher years ago. So it's really fun to see these people who I worked with, you know, many years ago, and now they're all grown up. And um, I was able to kind of invite them to have a show. And like you said, to your uh, role as a teacher, that somebody would sort of follow you through these different, not that she was following you, but that, but that she's, she's had these experiences with you in these different circumstances and is, and, and is wanting to maintain that relationship. Yeah. It's just really, um, I, I, I mean, I, I hope I'm a mentor to people like uh, at my age, like I hope I'm a mentor of some sort to um, my former students and, um, so it, 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 it tickles me. It's, it's like wonderful for me to have these people that I've all worked with, whether it's in uh, year round school or the governor's school for the arts or um, uh, in the case of Catherine, uh, she literally sought me out because she saw that I had studio space in New Albany. Shamia and Catherine both did, but like to, to be able to, um, you know, provide them with studio space Right. They're very, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm sponsoring their <laughs> studio space, basically. But be able to have that, be able to like help them kind of get launched and have the company. Like it's nice for me to have company. So, but it, it is really nice to have them come and put on their show. And they're really talented. And, um, uh, you know, they're, I, I'll be able to say, I remember when they were just sort of, you know, <laughs> you played a hand in the in that yeah, i just like it's nice to be part of the early years because they're gonna go places they're all very very talented well and just to make just to cover the the details here so the this uh, transitions exhibit you're talking about features uh because i, I want to get the work of six women shamia gaither i've got it in front of me shamia gaither okay. Catherine mccadden irene reed diana taylor ali wine and wine and erico whitaker Yes, yes, that's great. Yeah, and um, they're fabulous artists. They're, uh, there's painters and drawers and ceramic artists. All you know, there are a lot of different uh, types of work. And um, now, do they all have the work up to, at the same time, or is this a sequence? No, it's a group show, so okay. it's all together. Okay. And uh, I, I invite people to come. Um, I'm hoping they people can make time for both Fridays, come to come to New Albany on Friday, August 27th, and then come to Pyro the next Friday or the next Sunday, uh, uh, September 3rd or September 5th, I'm giving two receptions for um, Pyro's show. Right, well, September 3rd, and then you're, uh, uh, let's see, it's the, is it the, there's also an artist talk on September 26th, right? Yeah, I'm, and I'm also having a, a second reception on this Sunday, September 5th for people yeah. on Friday nights. I know like Friday okay. nights are hard for a lot of people. Well, is but that also, I think, you know, uh, I don't know if this was the thinking, but to have two receptions does sort of maybe space out the crowd so people don't, yes. maybe not so many people are crowded in at one yes. time. And we do require, we do provide masks, but we do require masks. Right. So. Well, um, and I think, you know, we're just, yes, we're in a time, and as people are requiring them, but I, I, I'm in the habit of wearing it, whether I see a sign requiring it or not, if I'm going inside someplace. Yeah, no, I, I feel more comfortable. And I think, 
I, you know, I, I, my feeling is it's not about me. It's not mm -hmm. about other people. Mm -hmm. It's about our, the nurses and our front line healthcare workers. Uh, they're they're getting increasingly over more and more overwhelmed, and we just need to give them a break. We just need to right. all wear a mask and get vaccinated so we don't burn out our doctors, oh. and nurses. And I know I know you know I know that there are, there are people with legitimate reasons why they are not being vaccinated right now. That you know that are their own medical business, but uh, to me, the the refusal to wear a mask is a real act of selfishness. Because you're exactly right. It really isn't about you or protecting you as much as it's about protecting others. Right. And it, it's really not, for me, it's not about our personal freedom at this point. It's about safeguarding our healthcare system because yes. there are so many people with cancer and other treatments that need to be able to get to the hospital on a regular basis. And when the hospitals fill up with COVID patients, the, the hospitals end up having to put all those treatments on hold. So it, it, yes, we want, we want people who have COVID to get to go to hospital and get healed, but we also have to think about all those people who need those cancer treatments to stay alive too. And you know, so it's, it's just, it's, it's way beyond our personal freedoms. It's about, it's about the health of everybody. Well, and I, I, I saw a thing on social media today that said, basically, you know, it, when, when, when you're being, when it's a choice for something that that's not about personal liberty, but when it's not a choice. So for example, if somebody is discriminating against you because you are uh, a person of color or you're gay or you have a handicap, you have no choice and that is discrimination. And if, but if you have a choice to do something and you don't do it, Nobody's robbing you of your personal liberty by requiring you to wear a mask. Any business can require you to wear a shirt, shoes. It's no different. I want, but you know, we're probably preaching to the converted. I find I'm very, I'm very happy to say that I find in all my interaction with arts and people who support the arts, I find that that is mostly a community that always has understood that they were the first people to mask and take precautions and do the things, and and were eager to get vaccinated. Um, you know, I don't, I, I don't know what I attribute that to, but I think people who are very involved in the arts and are supportive of arts have been, have gotten it from the very beginning. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, with some exception. I, I think there are a lot of people who get it and I, I'm actually impressed by the students because I think a lot of students get it. I think a lot of students want want to keep people safe, want to keep themselves safe, want to keep their grandparents and family, you know, family members safe. So um yeah, I'm I'm hopeful. I just yeah. Yeah. I hear those stories a lot that the kids get it. It's the parents that are the ones that are making this stand and uh but that the kids are actually much more agreeable to it. Um yeah. But yeah. Oh uh, well. Uh, so, so let's see what else you have so much going on, Susan, <laughs> what, what, so what's next after, after, uh, this exhibit, are you just, you know, of course you're going to, you're, you just started back to teaching. So that, that's a lot of your time now for the next nine months, right? Yeah. Oh, I can tell you though, I'm really excited because Brick Street is, and Pyro, both galleries are going to be part of the photo biennial. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, so after transitions, I'm actually, um, I, this is a little bit of nepotism, but not really, because I'm it's just a family, but I actually have a young photojournalist who's just been accepted into the Columbia uh, uh, Photojournalism School up in New York City. Um, she is gonna be my featured artist for the photo biennial, and um, her name is Abby Harrison. <laughs> <'cause she's laughs> my cousin's daughter, but, uh, She's really um, very convicted about what she does. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to offer her the opportunity to be part of the photo biennial because I think, you know, it's a pretty amazing, like a hats off to Paul Paletti. I mean, it's yeah. so wonderful that the Louisville photo biennial is in it, what is it, the 15th year? I mean, it's so, it's uh, some anniversary year this year. I think it's yeah, it's. It's it's and been it, around a while and it's and now, it's without Paul, it wouldn't 
have lasted this long. He is keeping talk about the the, the buoy and the, <laughs> the the life preserver. I mean, Paul has really poured himself into keeping it alive and really uh, to have like 40, 50 galleries part of our photo biennial and have it cross over into Indiana. And Julie Schweitzer has helped organize our the small group of Indiana galleries that are part of it. And so it's going to be really fun. And like people I'm not sure that it's, you know, I think it should change the name. It's not just it's it's kind of a regional thing, not just Louisville now, the Louisville photo biennial. I mean, because it's Frankfurt and uh, I, th I think that there were maybe some people in Lexington. I'm not sure. But anyway, you're right. It's a pretty good. It's a really broad range now of, uh, of miles. You could you could rack up some miles on your car. Yeah. Going and we're, we're doing a, a special um, ticket this year um, where people can go. They can kind of go around to the galleries and get their like tickets stamped. And then at the end, if they've been to a certain number of Louisville and um, Indiana galleries, they, they can put their name in for a drawing to, for um, a, a photograph donated by the artist. So we're trying to have some incentives for people to, trans, you know, go across the bridge and right, you know, there's look a at, yeah, look at both to stitch that there, Kentuckiana together. There's always a segment of the population uh, on both sides. I think that 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 seems to not want to cross the river. Uh, um, I know it's really fine. There's some sort of psychological divide. I think it's getting a little better. But uh, when I first moved over, when I left collegiate, and I I was actually director of pyro for a number of years. But when I left collegiate, I sold my house. Um, uh, on Murray Avenue in the Highlands, and in our house where we live in Jeffersonville. <laughs> It was so funny because people were going, you left the Highlands to live in Jeff? And we're like, yeah. And they were just so, and I just, um, I just get so tired of zip code snobbery. Like, um, <laughs> I really do. I just, um, I think we need to get over like the status of different neighborhoods and just realize we're, we're all part of one community, all well, rode together. And there's a non-toll bridge over to Jeff and there's a non-toll <laughs> bridge over to New Albany. So that's not even an excuse. Right. <laughs> the, the second street bridge is a nicer bridge anyway. It's a funner, older bridge anyway. So um, yeah. Well, so Susie Harrison, you have so much going on. And I'm glad you're so busy. You seem very happy about all of it. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to share a little bit about uh, the transition show at Brick Street and staying cozy or keeping cozy um, at Pyro Gallery. And right. Well, and just just to, let me just get the plug in there again. So this is uh, the show at Pyro is staying cozy during COVID comfort designs by Susie Harrison. It's up from September 3rd to the 26th. There's an opening reception on the third from six to 9 p.m. And then there's a, a Sunday reception on September the 5th from one to four. And then you're gonna talk about it on the 26th uh, at 2 p.m. So there's no excuse not to be at one of those things. <laughs> <laughs> programming, it's all about programming. And again, to reiterate, uh, so then the Brook Street Show Transitions opens the 27th with the reception from five to nine that night. Um, and I just have to put in a plug. They've been doing Instagram takeovers for the Brick Street Art Studios Instagram, yes. and they're really fun. Every artist has had a week this summer, and I encourage people to go look at them. Right. And so that's a, and so you are BrickStreetArtStudios.com and Brick Street. What's the Instagram? Probably Brick Street Art I think, Studios. Yeah, I think it's the same. It's, it's yeah. simple. It's, it's all these things are made, so it's not hard to find anything anymore. Yeah, I don't think it should be hard to find. Yeah, and they're really they're really fun. They they videotape themselves painting and talking and all sorts of stuff. All right. Well, thank you, Susie. Thank you so much. Thank you.